trace-based debugging and runtime analysis with UDE. So, um, yeah, let's get started. Um, a very short agenda, but uh, a lot of things that I uh, have to say and to show today. Um, and so let's get started for the next uh, 30 to uh, 40 minutes. So what is Trace support in UDE? Um, and what is Trace and why uh, you should use Trace or why it is interesting to use Trace? So Trace is a basically a hardware feature of the microcontrollers. Uh, there are a lot of microcontrollers on the market which provides trace support, which provides uh, specific uh, hardware units to observe the runtime behavior of the system of the applications running on the microcontrollers. So trace is for expanding the visibility of what's going on, what code is executed, which data are transferred and uh, which um, yeah, specific signals um, are used by your microcontroller when running the applications. The most important point is that trace is non-intrusive. That means uh, the application or the system uh, is not stopped during the observation. Uh, you can run the target at full target speed with the maximum clock frequency and you get sometimes not uh, but with the most trace um, systems on the market a cycle accurate um, trace of the executed functions and also um, a um, very exit timing of data transfers um, and you have also the possibility to do the trace for a multi-core system. So tracing uh, the activities on a subset or on all cores in parallel and also uh, the trace of um, transfers over the buses, uh, the different buses of your system uh, in parallel to a code trace. So the um, trace functions that we find in several types of microcontrollers are supported in UDE by a, um, we call it trace framework, which is a part of UDE, which has to be licensed separately. So with the basic license, you get no trace support, but uh, you can buy uh, the trace feature um, and use the trace features uh, then uh, inside the debug tool. So UDE supports different types of trace architectures from different vendors. Um, well known is um, from ARM the core side trace, uh, from Infineon um, the MCDS, which is available, for example, in the Oryx, which is also uh, which is today our target architecture for the demonstration and also for the power PCs and the power architecture devices from NXP and ST, the Nexus Trace. UDE supports two different types of trace uh, capturing methods, or we call it um, uh, capture devices. Uh, the first is tracing into a existing uh, on-chip trace memory, some targets um, implements this. Um, typically, uh, we find um, very small um, trace memories on chip uh, 1664K um, or up to uh, two or four megabyte. These are typically sizes of on chip trace memory, but we also support trace interfaces. Um, if you have no trace um, memory on chip or you want to um, perform um, long running traces with up to four gigabyte on trace data that has to be saved, uh, then we support it with uh, our devices UAD3 Plus and UAD2 Next um, 
over high speed uh, trace interfaces like a parallel trace that you find in uh, core site implementations, SSTP, uh, HSSTP, uh, which is the serial trace protocol from ARM or SWO. Uh, also, we support Nexus Parallel Trace and also um, the Aurora-based high-speed serial trace that we are use or that we are found in the uh, in the Oryx devices from Infineon. Um, besides these hardware features that uh, we um, have um, or that we support, um, we have also um, some software features. One of the software features which is uh, very useful, for example, for um, ha for um, yeah, high sophisticated trace units like we have with MCDS um, with um, yeah a lot of trace trigger and filter capabilities. Uh, we have a so-called universal emulation configurator UEC, which is um, intended to configure uh, the trace recording before the trace um, is started. This uh, UEC is available for MCDS from Infineon, uh, also for um, um, some of the um, uh, power PC or power architecture devices from NXP and ST and will be available soon uh, for Cortex-R and Cortex-A multi-core systems. So um, from the tool side or from the hardware side, um, we have trace support for all the devices um, that you can have uh, together with UDE. Um, for um, high-end and high-bandwidth trace, um, we support up to 4 gigabyte trace memory in the uh, UAD3 Plus device and it's also um, high-speed serial Aurora-based um, trace recording as well as parallel trace recording. The same is, is applies also to the UAD2 Next. Uh, we also support high-speed um, trace interfaces with a um, much lower bandwidth for that device and um, 512 megabyte trace memory. And if you have a um, trace device with a non-chip trace memory, you can also use the basic device of the UAD family, the UAD2 Pro, which allows you to uh, perform entry-level trace into an on-chip trace memory. Um, the device itself has no trace memory inside, so the trace capture has to be saved on target and um, read out by the debug interface and uh, analyzed then, then in, inside the UDE software. Okay, then um, what can be what can we do with trace? Uh, we can do several things. The first is trace-based debugging. Um, trace-based debugging is needed or is useful if you um, if you need to avoid um, the influence of the debug tool on the runtime behavior of the system. So trace is non-intrusive, so you can observe the runtime behavior and observe um, some bugs with the trace system um, and um, observe some bugs that would be hidden by um, a run mode debugging, for example. If you have um, bugs in the timing behavior or um, if you have bugs in the communication of a course um, in a parallel execution scenario, then trace would be uh, the best option. You can look back in time um, as well as uh, yeah, and um, yes, um, yeah. Find find for example um, deadlocks, race conditions, and timing issues. Um, at the other side, and the uh, other uh, use case for trace is uh, measurement and runtime analysis, and this is also uh, useful if you uh, want to. Um, 
avoid any influences on the runtime behavior by the debugger. And uh, also, if you do not allow, allow any code instrumentation uh, by measurement tools, for example. So typically, measurement tools um, change the code or the executable and add some hooks or some, some code that um, is communicating with the measurement tool or um, save some uh, counter values, um, etc. And um, in some applications, uh, some runtime critical applications, for example, uh, it is um, not a good idea to change the code because it is always um, affecting uh, the runtime behavior and sometimes also affecting the memory layout of your application. And uh, so trace is always a good uh, alternative. Uh, for measurement and runtime analysis, for example, for doing some profiling, um, doing core graph analysis, what this is, I'd like to show it uh, in a few minutes, and also to visualize the program execution or um, um, gathering the data to visualize the program execution and do some performance analysis or even do code coverage without code instrumentation. Okay, and then um, let's switch to the UDE. So I have uh, opened the debug tool, already loaded a workspace with an application. Uh, the target is a TC39 uh, uh, with six cores, but in this case, um, the application is uh, using only two core zero and the two uh, the core one. Um, on the core zero, we have a um, yeah a method calling some test methods uh, that uh, I'd like to to use to show you some uh, things, and we have also a um, a, a worker uh, function which um, calls or which periodically um, calls um, a worker function on core one where some um, yeah, basic threats or basic tasks um, are running here. It's a very stupid um, task scheduling scheme here used and um, with that uh, I'd like to show you some um, things that we can do with trace-based measurement. But for now, we want to start with a use case of trace-based debugging. On the core uh, zero, sometimes a trap occurs. So if you start the application here and um, change this test variable here, then we stop in a trap handler and uh, we have no idea or why we are here or why we are um, end up in this trap function. So it is very interesting for us uh, to find the root cause of the trap. You may use the registers to, um, of the Oryx um, to um, uh, find out, okay, what is, uh, what, what is the type of the trap? It's actually a trap four here. Um, a memory um, access uh, violation, but we do not know from the registers what is the root cause of this trap. And so um, the first thing we want to do is look back in time a little bit to find the history and uh, the way we uh, the application went to um, end up and leads us uh, to end up in this trap here. So then let's uh, get started with the trace. On the right side is the trace window. It's uh, empty because we did not uh, um, have a trace recording uh, yet. But um, now I'd like to start the trace. Before I can start the trace, I have to configure the trace. And for the Oryx, the USC is used. The USC is a window or a tool um, which allows you to 
compose a trace task for debugging or for measurement. For that, we provide some configuration blocks or simple task blocks, which, which uh, are used to configure the trace. Um, on the uh, left side, you see the library. There are two libraries shipped with U uh, UDE, a so-called compact library, which is um, yeah, intended for everyday tasks. And also a advanced library is available, which is much more complex and much more powerful and allow allows you to define very um, dedicated trace task, including also state machines and also multi-core tracing. But uh, for now, we are using the compact library and we want to perform a trace uh, until we are reaching the trap handler. And to do so, we need two things. The first is a initialization block uh, for the trace uh, system itself. You see, okay, we can change the trace memory that should be spent for the trace. And that is a feature of the Oryx because uh, the Oryx uses the, the trace memory not only for tracing, but also for calibration. So it is shared between the trace tool and the calibration tool. And if you have a calibration tool connected, then you have to limit the trace memory for uh, the trace. So in this case, we can uh, use the default value of 256k. Uh, uh, um, the next uh, important point is the trigger. The trigger is a point inside the trace stream which marks the interesting point that we want to see uh, later in the trace window. There are um, yeah, uh, two um, uh, boundaries. Uh, the first is pre and then post. Pre means that the trigger is issued by the trace system and everything after uh, the trigger condition is uh, stored or saved in the trace memory. And this is done as soon as the trace memory is not filled completely. And after the trace memory is uh, full, then the trace is stopped automatically. So you see ev everything um, right after the pre-trigger condition. And uh, the post-trigger condition, and uh, that we have to use in this case is for tracing everything right before the trigger con uh, condition occurs. So in this case, we want to trace until the trap handler is reached. So we use post trigger because the, the trigger condition marks the, uh, should mark the entry or uh, we want to, to mark the exit point of the trap handler here. And we select core zero um, in this case, because we are on course here. And the second, what we need is uh, this configuration block, which is um, to define for defining the trigger condition. Um, we use the code address for trigger condition and uh, look for the, the trap handler here. And we want to see everything right before the trap handler and the trap handler itself, the execution of the trap handler itself. And for Doing that, um, we use the end of function here. And um, the trace method is branch only. So that means uh, only branches or uh, every, um, every code that is, or every event that is uh, interrupt a sequential codes um, is traced and everything in between can be reconstructed by the debugger by looking into the ELF file. So we can do a branch only trace and we do not need any timing information right now for that uh, example. Okay, so that's all for this trace. So we start the application and start the trace. So then you see, okay, uh, the trace is running right now and then we are uh, issue the trap. So the trace system has captured the trap condition or the, the um, trap handler. 
and um, we go now to the trigger and you see okay uh, we are at the very end of the trace recording and you see okay here is an interrupt which mark uh, occurred so it's marked as interrupt it's um, actually the trap handler uh, which is um, uh, executed right now and if you go uh, a little bit upwards uh, you see here code that should be uh, that could be the reason for the trap so we can double click here and we are going to the code and see okay here is something that should be um, th that should be investigated and uh, if you know the oryx uh, architecture then uh, you know that a uh, access to that address would uh, lead into a trap form Okay, so that was the first step, um, doing some trace-based um, debugging. Um, then we want to uh, look at the core one execution. So I told you there are some tasks that are executed here with a very stupid scheduling scheme. And uh, we want to look at this scheduling and want to um, want to investigate if everything is okay or is there anything that needs to be uh, corrected. On that, um, I change the trace configuration, I clear the task or I can save it um, if you like, uh, if you need it um, uh, later on, but for this we can skip this, clear the task and um, um, prepare a new one for runtime analysis. For that, we are using uh, also the, the initialization block and use then all the trace memory which is available. Um, we need now a, uh, a um, also a pre, in this time a pre-trigger and select core one. Um, and then uh, we uh, want to trace everything um, starting from the core one worker. Um, and um, now in order to save trace memory, we change the trace method to a very nice feature of the MCDS uh, from Infineon. Uh, that's a unique feature uh, that we only find in the um, uh, devices from, from Infineon, the compact function trace. And the compact function trace um, captures only uh, calls and returns uh, of the executed functions, nothing in between. Um, the uh, drawback of that approach is that we cannot see inside any function, but um, the advantage of this is we save a lot of trace memory and um, we have a very good uh, starting point for do some function level analysis. Um, okay, we select uh, compact function trace here and enable the, uh, the timing information so that we can um, analyze this and can provide or can um, visualize uh, the task or the, the um, execution of these task functions here. So we start the trace, it takes some time to configure the trace and then it takes some time uh, to capture the trace because um, we are getting a lot of uh, information to do the compact function trace trace method. Okay, and you can see in the trace window, you have only calls and returns here. So for a better visibility of the um, executed or the execution sequence, we can open the execution sequence uh, window, which is, um, which you can find in the uh, fuse menu. And from that, you perform the analysis. And we have only core one available. Uh, we have no operating system here, so we have no task trace. 
Um, so um, it is marked as unknown process, but we have uh, a lot, uh, some functions that are executed here. Okay, we see, okay, the, the core one worker, then the four task functions here and a delay function. Okay, and if you zoom, for example, in this point in time uh, into the trace, you see, okay, the task 10 milliseconds, um, for the task 10 milliseconds, there is a gap in the periodic um, execution of this task. So the reason is obviously that the task 50 milliseconds um, takes sometimes not not in all cases too much time and the task 10 milliseconds didn't get the chance to be executed in this case. So why is it? So we are interested in a more precise uh, timing information. And for that, uh, I open another window. Uh, this is called the call graph window. And the call graph window is only available if you um, check in the add-in components the core graph analysis add-in. But the core graph analysis add-in is not a um, additional a license that you have to buy, it is always part of the trace license. So we checked the core graph analysis at in and then we opened the core graph window. And this is the core graph window and we have um, here a drop down box which allows us to select the core for which we want to do the core graph analysis. We select core one and start the analysis. And then the analysis will provide us uh, information in four tabs here. Um, we have two tabs for the core graph itself and two tabs for um, profiling information. Uh, the core graph is um, a nice view or a nice representation of the core um, hierarchy or the um the the core the, the core relationships the dynamic core graph which is the first tab um con counts all the cores um and differentiates by the by the callers so we have a delay function which is called by task 100 and task 200 milliseconds and you see okay uh, the delay function is uh, called 20 times by 100 millisecond task and um, two time, uh, 10 times by the 200 millisecond uh, task function. Um, instead, in the static core graph, we count, count uh, for the delay function every call. It does not matter um, if it's um, called by the 100 millisecond task or by the 200 millisecond task. This is also um, important if you change to the profiling window in the dynamic profiling uh, table, you see the delay is um, that the delay function um, is existing uh, two times, uh, one time for the, uh, for the call by 100 millisecond task and the second for the 200 millisecond task. But this is not uh, not interesting for us at the moment. We are interesting in the, the 50 millisecond task. I go to the static. Um, here you see the delay is only um, existing uh, once, uh, but uh, we are interesting in the 50 millisecond task. And if you go to the time, the maximum time this task is running, um, then we see, okay, it is in this case um, 18 millisecond. So, and this is very much too long for a 10 millisecond scheduling scheme here. So, we have to investigate why we are, uh, why this, this 50 millisecond task takes uh, so long uh, in some cases. And for that, um, I'd like to do some trace-based uh, debugging again uh, with a much more sophisticated 
um, and um, a much more tailored um, trace configuration. So I restart the application to show that and load a pre-configured task. This is this one. And this looks a bit much, a bit complicated, but it's uh, quite simple. In this uh, case, I used the advanced library to configure this task. The advanced library has a much more complex or powerful or flexible initialization block. Uh, we use um, one megabyte trace memory, post trigger mode. This is, this is known to you what this is. Um, we use uh, trace for core one. We can here enable also trace for for um, other cores. Uh, the MCDS allows us to trace up to three cores in parallel. Um, this is a hardware limitation, not a limitation of the of the tool here. Um, okay, but we we are interested in only in core one and uh, select core one for this traced observation channel. Um, and then we need some timing information here and um, MCDS provides us several timers uh, which can be scaled uh, to a period of um, in the range of nanoseconds or uh, into minutes if you like and uh, for this uh, we use this pre-scaler setting and in this case uh, we use a prescaler setting of one microsecond. That means the timer is uh, incremented. Uh, it's it's actually a counter. The counter is incremented uh, every one microsecond. Okay. The uh, two blocks below uh, define some events or signals. Um, a signal which indicates, okay, we have um, entered the 50 millisecond task and a um, block which um, shows us, okay, we leave this block. Then we define the timer, which is used to measure the time of the, the uh, 50 millisecond task. And uh, it issues a event or a signal if we exceed uh, three milliseconds. Okay, three milliseconds should be a good, good value uh, which uh, should be okay for this task um, that the scheduling scheme uh, will work um, as expected. Okay, and with these information or with these events, we can perform or we can set up a state machine um, based on two states. The initial state here, uh, which waits for entering the, the task function and then goes to state one and starts the timer. The watch point is not important uh, here. It, it can be used for finding uh, some um, points in the trace recording later on. Um, when we are in state one, so state one means, okay, we are executing the, the task um, function. Um, then we test for two events. The first event is we leave it, okay, and the timer is not exceeded. That's the, the case, everything is fine. Um, we go back to state zero, which is the initial state and wait for another uh, execution of the task function and restore the timer. And um, the second uh, test is uh, if the timer exceeds while we are in this function, then we want to stop the trace, trigger the trace, and uh, save also the timer into the trace stream. And in the meanwhile, um, as a general block here, uh, we want to uh, do a complete program trace with timing information. Okay, if you start this trace, I have to start the application. Okay, start the trace again. Oops, why it's counting back? Okay, ah, okay, I have to reload the application. Start the application and then start the trace again. <clears throat> 
so okay uh, the trace has been stopped um, automatically that means um, uh, we hit the condition that the task function uh, takes too long so we can go to the the trigger condition okay and then we see okay here three milliseconds the timer has exceeded and stopped and right before uh, the timer has uh, exceeded we see some code that is executed so we can double click and go into the function and then we can see okay ah, we have a very long running while loop here uh, which may cause the, um, the this uh, long running task so if we want to uh, correct this behavior it's very simple I change this to five and then I can check this again we load uh, the um, trace task that we used for the execution sequence um, start this and then start analysis and look what is the result of the changes in the in the variable oh, looks better so we see okay there is no gap uh, in the task uh, 10 millisecond there is uh, not a real equidistant um, task scheduling but uh, due to the the time that we have here for the webinar uh, we want to not to investigate the reason for that you can do now the time measurement if you you can set two markers here and measure the time in between okay it's, it takes a bit too long here and we have to find out uh, why it's not a equidistant um, execution here of the task 10 minutes ago. but it's a better result than we had before the last thing I'd like to show you uh, here, okay, uh, we can do the core graph analysis again and see the, the timing. You see, okay, the task 50 milliseconds takes now three milliseconds. It was former 18 milliseconds. Okay, the last thing I'd like to show you is uh, trace-based uh, code coverage. A uh, trace-based code coverage is typically used in automatic testing. So it is seldom used in a interactive debugger session, but it can be used. Uh, so um, I'd like to show you how to use it. The first thing you have to do is enabling the code coverage in the debug server configuration. Go to add in trace and code trace use cases and here you can select two types of code coverage statement coverage and branch coverage we select branch coverage right now press ok then we open the code coverage window which is empty at the moment uh, and set a um, set a task i have prepared this before it's also very very simple we have um, two events one for starting the trace one for ending the trace and if we go to the code here and uh, look for the the test coverage function you see okay trace on trace off and everything in between should be traced there are two uh, three functions which are um, which are tested and there is a test case which is this this variable here which is incremented and uh, goes from in this case from um, zero to one um, and uh, with zero and one we are uh, testing these three functions so then we start the uh, the trace and then we start the coverage test in the application and from here we get the 
branch coverage. You see, okay, uh, two functions are covered uh, 100% and uh, the test functions are not covered 100%. And then you have to find the reason for that. Um, test function one, we can go inside and you see uh, with the screen markers, this is the statement coverage, which can be also um, calculated based on the branch coverage. And uh, then we look into the function and see, okay, with the with this max uh, test step of two, that means we have a step zero and step one tested, but nothing else. So the pass through the function uh, without executing the if bodies here is not covered. So for a 100% test, we need to change or we need to add some more test cases. Um, for example, we need to do four maybe, then we start the coverage again and then hopefully we get a 100% coverage. Trace this recording, I go to the coverage window and see, okay, uh, everything looks good. Test function one is covered 100% for branch coverage and also the other test functions. And if, go to, if I go to the test function, then you see, okay, the statement coverage is quite the same. Uh, but you can't, can't see in this mode here the, the path coverage or the branch coverage, but this is uh, represented in this diagram here. And from that you can also uh, um, perform or uh, create some reports uh, that you can use for your documentation. But uh, as I said before, this is um, used by automatic tests. Um, there are some test tools available which communicates with UDE and use the, the trace, trace based code coverage function for providing some uh, information about the quality of your test cases. Okay, that's all for today. Uh, we are running out of time a little bit, so let's go quickly through the summary. Um, I told you that uh, we support with UDE um, trace uh, systems um, based on different targets, um, different microcontroller uh, architectures, um, different trace architectures like court site, MCDS, Nexus, and also tracing over different trace interfaces. Um, I showed you some trace-based debugging scenarios or use cases. Uh, and how to use the UEC for that. Um, and then uh, we did some measurements and runtime analysis task um, profiling code coverage. I showed you the execution task sequence uh, and, and, and task sequence. Uh, what I didn't show you is Arthos task trace. That means that for specific Arthoses, we provide also support for um, uh, capturing task information um, like for OSIC based operating systems, AutoSAR, and also for other AUTOS systems. Okay, then thank you very much and uh, thank you for your attention to this last webinar. Mm -hmm.